brothers and sisters, you are tuned in to the worship service of the Greater Little Zion Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Murphy, and we welcome you to this wonderful worship experience. Sit back now and enjoy our music ministry as they will come and share with you from the spoken word by way of song. And I'll come back and share with you in the preaching of God's word. Be blessed as the word of God blesses your spirit. Thank you for joining with us for this Sunday's virtual worship experience on this beautiful fall day. For those of you who forgot to set your clocks back one hour and logged in too early, we welcome you back and thank you for joining us again. These are the announcements for the virtual activities here at Greater Little Zion for the week of November 7th. We're still worshiping virtually, and as a reminder, Adult Sunday School is held each Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Adult Sunday School is followed by our virtual church service at 10 a.m. 
You're invited to join us for an hour of inspirational praise and worship by our music ministry and a powerful message from our pastor, Rev. Dr. James T. Murphy, Jr. We're all looking forward to the day when it's safe to resume our in-person worship services. And until then, we will continue to thank God for our ability to worship virtually and honor Him with our praises. The prayer ministry meets on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. and you are invited to join in with a group of Zion prayer warriors as they offer intercessory prayers for our church, community, nation, and the world at large. If you would like to join, please notify the admin office so that you can be registered to receive the Zoom link for these prayer sessions. Special requests for prayer can also be emailed or called in to the admin office. Deacons Anthony Baysmore and Calvin Parsons Sr. are the points of contact for the prayer ministry. The adult Bible study is held each Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. and Pastor Murphy facilitates each session. The Zoom link and details on the current study are sent to your email each week and you're encouraged to attend and become a part of these sessions. Don't forget, the Youth and Young Adult Bible Study and Sunday School is held each Saturday at 10 a.m. and all youth and young adults are invited to attend. Sisters, please remember to register for the Women's Bible Study that will convene this Saturday, November 13th at 9.30 a.m. You're invited to join and participate in a very inspirational morning of interactive study and wonderful fellowship led by Dr. Patricia Edwards. Please send your RSVP to the admin office and you will receive the Zoom link to log into this session. For the month of November, the Family Ministries prayer focus is titled, Thankful for Family. As we prepare to share in the celebrations of Thanksgiving, you are invited to join the ministry with your prayers, thanking God for his gift of families and the many blessings he has provided, and to continue seeking his direction in their lives. Deacons Anthony and Terry Bazemore are the points of contact for the family ministry. The Evangelism and Missions Ministry is hosting a Thanksgiving drive through food distribution on Thursday, November 18th from 5 to 7 p.m. Please note that families must sign up to reserve a basket no later than next Sunday, November 14th. Please check your emails for the flyer that was sent providing additional information on how to sign up and reserve a basket, along with the information on details the ministry is requesting that you provide. This Thanksgiving drive through distribution will take place rain or shine, and COVID safety requirements will be strictly followed. The Evangelism and Missions Ministry also extends their sincere appreciation for your continued generous response to their request for $25 Visa gift cards and non-perishable food items to restock the Zion Pantry. Your acts of kindness will provide abundant blessings to families in need during the upcoming holiday season. Donations of $25 Visa gift cards will be accepted until December 11th, and you still have time if you would like to support the ministry's endeavor. This is a reminder for an upcoming community event. Remember to log in for a virtual Give Back reunion concert on Saturday, November 13th at 5 p.m., featuring Sister Christian D. Davis, along with past and current members of Chosen Royalty. This concert will be live streamed on YouTube and Facebook Live, and it will benefit several area food banks and local charities. This Thursday, November the 11th, is Veterans Day, and we celebrate and honor the men and women who have served are still serving 
and those who are preparing to serve our country. Thank you for your service and sacrifices that you and your families have made. At this time, please pause for a moment of silence as we remember the men and women who served and made the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you and have a blessed week. Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 28 and 29, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, verse 28 and 29. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning, and here is what it says. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. This kind can be cast out only by prayer. 
prayer, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit, says the disciples. We want to preach and teach this morning from the subject, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we do that? Have you ever observed with amazement at the accomplishment of a task by another and wondered to yourself, why couldn't I have done that? Have you ever witnessed the believed heightened spirituality of a person and wondered why could I not be that way? Have you ever witnessed someone conquering something in their life and wondered to yourself, why couldn't I do that myself? Sometimes the answer is simply quickly noted. It really can be something as clear as we are inexperienced, we just lack the expertise to handle the challenge, or it could be we are unprepared, we just did not prepare ourselves for the challenge as adequately as we knew we possibly could have, or it could be that we were simply careless. We just didn't take the task serious enough and the end result was not what we so desired. Or we could have been too independent and not dependent enough on divine help. Spiritual matters could require a different kind of analysis. Our inability to witness a specific outcome could very well be due to our own biblical illiteracy. Not reading the scriptures certainly could contribute to a depressed and disappointing outcome. There is a disturbing answer that's provided by Jesus to the Sadducees who sought to question him about marital status once we ascend into heaven. His response was in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, you do error, King James, ye do error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. The New American Standard says you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. And the Eugene, or should I say the J.B. Phillips translation, the modern English translation says, you are ignorant of both the scriptures and the power of God. The Sadducees in their questioning was about who would be married in heaven once in their previous life as they use the example of a man who dies and has no children and his preceding his succeeding brothers marry his wife and it ends up being five to six to seven and when they get to heaven says the Sadducees who will she be married to what they fail to know or understand about marriage in heaven was that the scripture makes clear that they not only didn't know what the scripture says but they didn't know the power of God. In fact, Jesus makes clear that when you get to heaven, you'll be like the angels. There is no marriage. There is no male, no female, but you are purely the celestial glory of God. Those are two practices that if they are inactive or weak in your life, you will often be left asking what happened. Not knowing the scripture, and not knowing the power of God. You will be left with wrestling with the question, why couldn't I finish that task? Why couldn't I do that, i.e., like we witnessed Jesus did? In fact, Jesus says that the works that he did, we will do also, but he added greater works than these once he ascends back to the Father and in return sends the Holy Spirit. The disciples had a legitimate question, why couldn't we do that? But you and I 
have the same wrestling question. Such a weakness can be exposed between what I call sanctuary lights in the space of worship and street lights where reality takes place. It happens between Sunday and Monday, between the tragedy and the triumph. That's what's happening to these disciples in the context of Mark 9, beginning in verse 14. They are those, they are leaving the glorious Sunday morning experience on the mount and now they have come down to the reality in the valley below the mount. They've witnessed this high time of rejoicing like never before. I mean, when you read the text, you are overwhelmed with joy and with excitement with the guest appearances of both Elijah and Moses coupled with Jesus and the Father and then listening to the reverberation, the, the powerful voice of God that affirms his son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Peter, James, and John knew that that was a worship gathering experience like they had never seen before. It was memorable and they knew it. So much so that Peter says, let us build three tabernacles here, Lord, since we are here because it's such a grand place that we certainly want to memorialize it. But when they left the sanctuary lights, says Mark 2 through 13, and they entered the street lights, this entire episode of verse 14 through 27, they encountered the field of work. They encountered opposition, they encountered tension, they encountered the task that proved impossible to the other disciples that they joined. The episode begins like this and take your Bibles and watch as we go through the text because there are a number of evolutions that we experience and notice not only in their context of noticing that there was something that they could not do but we likewise can identify with the disciples' experience. Listen to the text. When they, when they come down from the mountain, it says to us in verse 14, clause A, the first thing they encountered was a crowd. A crowd. Look at what the text says. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd. And in that crowd, there was a commotion. There was chaos. There were even those who were there who just merely wanted to see excitement. They wanted to see what was happening. And that often happens when you go through things sometimes. There's a crowd that gather around and that crowd generally wants to see how will you handle it? What effect upon you will this moment have? You have to be cognizant of the crowd because the crowd can be both a positive and a negative. They encountered the, encountered the crowd, but also when you look beyond the crowd, verse 14, clause B, there was a confrontation. Listen to the text. Some of the teachers of religious law were arguing with them. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically the exact topic of the argument or discussion, but it's my suspicion that it's highly suggested that the disciples they were discussing, the, the teachers there, the religious rulers, the religious teachers were discussing the inability of the disciples to perform what they had said they could do in the name of Jesus. They were pointing at them, raising questions because in his absence, they were supposed to be able to do whatever Jesus could have done. Not necessarily true, but at least they thought they should be able to do that, the religious teachers. Who were they? The Sadducees, the scribes, perhaps the Pharisees. And they confronted these disciples argumentatively. It's as if people would say, I thought you said what prayer could do or what you could do through prayer or what your faith could accomplish. I thought you simply said all you had to do was believe and God would make a way. 
those who are in opposed to you can bring about a confrontation. But Jesus descends with them and he creates a conversation. His entire presence alone, beginning in verse 15, suggests that when he shows up, occurs, a conversation is developed. Look what the text says. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. They came to see Jesus, no doubt, or should I say, they saw Jesus descending and certainly probably assumed in their minds, surely, whatever answers we need about life or whatever we desire in regard to our condition, he can now handle it, he's here. But Jesus poses a question. He wants to know, since this confrontation occurred, why is there so much argument? Look at what he says in verse 16. What is all this arguing about? The conversation that Jesus spurs merely because his presence is there, the crowd is exciting, but it's conversational because the criticism that comes from his critics critics of Jesus and the disciples why couldn't they do what you proclaim that you could do and they being disciples of yours should be able to do whatever you do no response by Jesus in the text meaning that the disciples are left there of course I believe to deal with the scenario, but only by way of observation. Because once Jesus spurs this conversation between himself and perhaps the crowd, once he begins to spur the ideas that could lead to deep conversation from the religious critics, instead, attention in the text is drawn to the commotion and the chaos in the text look at verse 17 and 18 one of the men in the crowd because no one else responded to Jesus but this one man who steps forth in an attempt to answer Jesus question sometimes it may not be you in which a response may come to your critics it may see may be someone else that God may use to stand up and declare truth on your behalf. This man, says the text, stood up when he spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Look at verse 18. And whenever this spirit seized him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grids his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit and they couldn't do it. That sounds like an underscore of the religious critics, criticism perhaps of the disciples who couldn't do what they were supposedly anointed to do. You might ask why couldn't they in the previous chapters of Jesus work with the disciples they had went out by way of commission and they had been out casting out demons and says the disciples many have been healed in your name Lord and they trembled demons did at the presence of your name and in this incident though they couldn't bring about a deliverance of this man's son could it be to remind us that you can't depend merely on past successes in terms of your answered prayer, but that each episode requires a dedication to yielding to God, to conversing with God, to praying to God, that you might receive a fresh anointing on each occasion. In the book of Acts, it's made clear that both the disciples and the church came back repeatedly for fresh outpourings of the Holy Spirit because you can become depleted. And in this moment of chaos, in this moment of commotion, you have this challenge that suggests 
that these disciples who were there at the foot of the mount perhaps had been depleted or had depended too much on the past, not remembering that every encounter with God is a new encounter. So what do we have? We have a father who is trembling We have a son who is troubled and then we have a demon who's destructive. A father who's trembling because he wants his son's life to be rescued. A son who's troubled because a demon has caused chaos in his life. And a demon who has nothing more than the intention of being destructive. Listen again to what the demon does. When it seizes him, which highly suggested that the demon may not be active every day, but comes back periodically enough to disturb the equilibrium of the young man's life. To throw him to and fro. And that's what the devil does often with us. We think that he's gone and he may be gone for a season but he's bound to come back again. And the Bible says that when he does, he violently throws that child to the ground and then that child ends up foaming at the mouth, ends up gritting his teeth, ends up being rigid, suggesting that he's lost control of his own life. That's when the enemy attacks us and we sort of lose control by no longer being patient, no longer being faithful, no longer being prayerful, no longer being scriptural, no longer being committed, and we end up losing control. And in all that chaos and all that commotion, Jesus comes back to respond to the indictment by the Father. I brought my son to your disciples, says the text, and they couldn't cast out the demon. And Jesus responds with a condemnation. Look at what he says in verse 19. You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. It's a rhetorical question. It's a question that spurs their own consideration of where they are in their spiritual walk with God. Jesus says in the text, you haven't learned yet. You have not learned after all you've seen me do. After all I have done before your eyes, you still don't know the power of God. And what Jesus has to do after the condemnation is he now has to deal with the conflict. And verse 20 through 23 reveals the conflict. Look at it says, so they brought the boy to Jesus, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. He fell to the ground and he was foaming at the mouth. And Jesus poses a life-changing question to the man. How long has he been like this? How long has this been happening in his life? And the father says, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or throws him into the water. But here's the objective, trying to kill him. Remember what Jesus would later tell us in John 10 and 10, the mission, the objective of Satan is to steal, kill, and destroy But this man, this father knew by way either of rumor or by way of experience that Jesus has come to give life and to give it more abundantly. And so Jesus begins to handle the conflict. What's the conflict? The conflict is really a battle between bondage and freedom. 
And when Jesus says, how long has this boy been like this? He was really setting the father up in a way to recognize now at this moment, I need your full surrender and to trust me because something that is now happening requires more than just a speaking of the word, but there has to be some depth and root in the word as a part of your life. And when you read the passage, particularly as we get to verse 23, with the end of verse 22, the man makes after listening and watching Jesus handle the conflict, the man makes an incredible cry. Listen to what he says. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. So he must have some belief because he brought his son to Jesus. But his belief was not stretched or didn't have roots deep enough to believe at the level in which he would need to see his son transformed. Remember what we saw in the Jairus miracle. And the Jairus miracle was that Jairus needed another level of faith and Jesus set up the scenario by having him watch the woman get healed who merely reached for her healing. In this text, I want to contend that Jesus, I think divinely, knew that the man was at the bottom of the hill, but for the sake of the disciples and even for himself, he allowed this scenario to play out where the disciples could not do what they thought they could do. Perhaps there's a lesson in all of this for everyone who's involved in this episode. The disciples who needed to know that you can't merely depend on your past successes in terms of your ministry journey. The man, to help him understand that yes, you brought him to me, but do you believe that I can do anything? And then the onlooking crowd who's just standing there wondering what the outcome of this moment is going to be. But Jesus has a response to the man's cry. You're asking if I can do anything? Your son's deliverance, your deliverance is not dependent on merely what I can do. It's depending on what you believe I can do. Because with God, isn't that what he says? With God, anything is possible if one person believes. That's what he says right there in verse 23. Anything is possible if a person could believe. You may be wrestling with that same kind of attitude. You may be dealing with that same kind of problem. I believe God, I've seen the great things that God has done, but in my scenario now, my issue is so large, I'm not sure if God will come through for me. God, if you can help me, please do so. If, if is a conditional clause. If suggests that some other scenarios have to be in place or something has to line up in order for me to answer that prayer. And Jesus is making clear anything is possible if you're willing to believe. That right there is a prophetic revelation, a rhema word for somebody this morning. It's not if God can do it, will you believe that God can do it? That's what the text says. And so Jesus hears his cry, but when Jesus responds, Anything is possible to the one who believes. Listen to the man's confession. I believe, but help my unbelief. In other words, I've got some faith, God, but I need more. And I need for you to help me get to the level to which I need. And watch what Jesus does to handle his confession 
Jesus worked through the demonstration of bringing deliverance to the boy's life. He then moves to the mode of command. Listen to the text. I love this part. Listen to the text, verse 25. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers were growing, in other words, knowing that in conversation with the man, the people are looking, but the crowd is looking. Jesus says, I'm going to give revelation and demonstration that everyone can see when you walk by faith and not by, by sight, but also if you use the power of your tongue, victory is yours. Look at the text. He saw the crowd growing. He rebuked the evil spirit. And look what Jesus does with his words. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. Here it is. Underline this in your Bible. I command you. And I'm here to tell you this morning that there are times in which you have to command when you're dealing with evil. I command in the name of Jesus, you will not have my son. You will not have my daughter. You will not have my wife. You will not have my husband. I command in the name of Jesus, you will not take that sickness and destroy their life. I command in the name of Jesus, you will not allow, I will not allow that racism to destroy the future of my children. You got to command sometime in the name of Jesus. That name carries the life-changing power that we say, you better use it. And when I hear Jesus tell us, whatsoever you ask my name, the Father will answer to confirm who he is. I'm going to use that name. Look what Jesus did. I command you. That's what the text says. I command you to come out of that child. And look at the closing line, and never enter him again. That's power. That's power. That's Jesus showing us, showing the disciples, showing the Father, showing the crowd, you've got to use the power to which you have, but it's dependent. You have to recognize my dependency is totally on God's divine provision and not merely on what happened in yesterday's experience. <laughs> I'll just give this simple illustration. Last year, you may win the Super Bowl. You may win the NBA championship. But this year, you have to do the same thing all over again and prepare because it's a new year. And because you won last year doesn't mean you're going to win this year. Because you could have a number of deficiencies that show up that will keep you from getting to where you need to be. Could be injuries, could be player trades, anything could happen. Oh, and by the way, the other teams could get better. And here's what Jesus is trying to tell us and what I'm trying to tell you by way of example, you gotta prepare. You gotta prepare because spiritual wickedness in high places is fresh every single day. But you have the blessed assurance that not only is Jesus is yours, but says Jeremiah in his lamenting moment of lamentations, morning by morning, new mercies you get to see. In all that you need, God's hand will provide for you because God is faithful. And Jesus uses the power of his tongue, says the text, to tell that evil spirit to come out and never come back to this child again. So then there's a conclusion. And the conclusion is the response of the people. Look at what the text says. The spirit screamed and threw the boy into violent convulsions and left him. He left a scar. He left what would be considered a permanent mark so that anybody looking at that boy can see that this child has been through a turbulent moment. And the enemy will do that to you. Some of us, he's left some scars. We've got some scars to prove that we've been through a tough time. But what makes us keep moving in the midst of the toughness is what Jesus does after what the evil one has done. Look at the story. The murmur began to run through the crowd and the people said he's dead because they're only looking at the outward appearance. 
But look what Jesus does. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Because at that moment, the disciples, the crowd, and the father needed to see an image of liberation, an image of resurrection. They needed to see that God can not only change and transform your life, but he won't leave you in that condition to which he found you. So Jesus took him by the hand, raised him up, and the boy stood up, and his entire life has been restored. Let's let the text speak for itself. Says the Bible, Jesus took him by the hand, helped him to his feet, and he stood up. There was a conclusion that the crowd obviously was starting to conclude with, he's dead. But Jesus knows how to rewrite your story. Jesus knows how to put various punctuations in your story, in your paragraphs of life. Jesus knows how to turn the page. Well, the concern was raised by the disciples. The concerns was, Master, how in the world, when they got in the privacy with their Lord, could we not do the same? They were feeling powerless, they were feeling poor, they were feeling paralyzed, and they began to inquire of Jesus, how come we couldn't cast out that spirit? And Jesus said, I like what the living Bible paraphrase says, cases like this can only, and they require prayer. Nothing else, prayer. The kinds of problems that you see here, says Jesus, these pain predicaments, these protests, if you're looking for deliverance and breakthrough in healing, they require divine conversation, divine connection. As I close, what is prayer? Ole Helsby in his classic book entitled Prayer says this, he says this definition, prayer is nothing more involved than to let Jesus into our needs. To pray is to give Jesus permission to employ his powers in the alleviation of our distress. To pray is to let Jesus glorify his name in the midst of our needs. Personally, you need to know that there will be some situations that you cannot resolve without the power of prayer. I think it's interesting to note that in the midst of this, and that seems to be a part of what the subject of this entire episode is, notice Jesus doesn't offer a single prayer. <laughs> He's telling them that this kind of thing only comes by way of healing through prayer, but Jesus doesn't offer a single prayer. Why? Perhaps because Jesus is constantly in conversation with the Father, not only early in the morning, but through the course of the day. Philip Henry says it this way, be sure you look to your secret duty. Read back to the Gospels and you'll find Jesus going off in the morning into the mountain to pray by himself with the Father. Then when you read the Gospels, notice how Jesus also takes moments to cry out to God in the midst of a moment. John 16 and 17 is a good example to see that happen. That's, for me, Jesus' way of depicting to us that prayer isn't just a morning thing or an evening thing. It's an all-day thing. Because you need that anointing such that you need to be in constant contact. As Philip Henry says, be sure you look to your secret duty. Keep that, what, keep that up, whatever you do. The soul cannot prosper in the neglect of it. Be much in secret fellowship with God. Pray alone, which means that through the course of the day, converse with God. Let prayer be the key 
of the morning and the bolt of the night. Let prayer be the key of the morning. Start with it and let prayer be the bolt at night. End with it. John Christensen said it this way, the potency of prayer have subdued the strength of fire, bridled the rage of lions, asked Daniel, extinguished wars, asked Israel, expelled demons, asked this father and his son, and burst the chains of death, asked Jarius about that in regard to his daughter. So what's the lessons learned? What, what can we begin to think about when we wrestle with why can't we do that as Jesus does? And I want to confess that I think that Jesus says, let's go back to the basics. Number one, you need to raise your awareness about prayer. Prayer is like the reading of scripture. It's not seasonal. It's not a seasonal pursuit, but you have to do it all the time. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray. Some translations say, and not faint. Some say, and never give up. Some say, and never stop. I think it's Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We are to pray without ceasing, without stopping. You got to raise your awareness that I need to be in prayer at all times. Secondly, you got to change your attitude about prayer. We often pray about small things sometimes or if they are large. And really, Jesus is trying to tell us you got to pray about everything, no matter how small or large it is. Remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, particularly in verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he'll direct your path. But keep in mind, the greater the challenge, the greater the prayer intensity will be. Daniel chapter 10 gives us a clear illustration that Daniel is praying, looking for answers or clarification in reference to a vision that God had given him. And the angel is on the way with the, with the answer, but the angel is hung up. There is this wickedness in high places that attempted to stop the answer to Daniel, but the angel called in reinforcement and the angel was able to come to give Daniel his answer because we have to change our attitude about what we're praying about and here's the addendum, also what we have to be patient about. So raise our awareness about prayer, change our attitude about prayer, and recognize the advantages of prayer. We all want power, but Jesus seems to make clear in this moment, you're not going to get it. Particularly when you talk about various forms of opposition, you need prayer power. You're not going to get it until you go and call on the name of the Lord. Peace. Paul makes clear in the Philippian letter that he says, you know, don't be anxious about anything, but bring it all. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding. He'll give it to you. It comes through prayer, patience, waiting on God as Daniel did in Daniel 10, waiting on God to bring that answer and sometimes that answer is, is hung up for many reasons, hung up unto us. But God knows what God is doing. Patience, provision. And in that provision, God gives us what we need. That's why we have to seek the Lord. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And most important, I believe, is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what prayer does. Strengthens our relationship with God through his son. And so when you think about, Lord, how come I couldn't get this? How come I couldn't get that? How come we couldn't succeed here? How come we couldn't overcome over there? Jesus says, oh, clearly, this kind of situation 
can only be handled by prayer. And in the old King James version, it says by prayer and fasting because both require a mode of consecration, a mode of dedication, a mode of submission and commitment to the sensitive voice of God, which is tough to do. But here's an element that we're going to talk about in prayer in the weeks to come. Confession, emptying out, letting God deal with our hidden sin, our hidden passions, those things that create roadblocks from helping us to be what we can be. Because God wants to use us, but he wants us to be vessels that are constantly in progress for the kingdom of God. Why couldn't we do that? Because some things can only be handled by the practice of prayer. Father, thank you for this moment in which we now come to realize that all things are possible through prayer. That's what Jesus has made clear to us. And I pray that at least if nothing more, God, our hearts, our minds have been stirred to set aside time every day to spend with you and then to converse with you through the course of the day and then to close our day's journey with a conversation with you. I pray, Lord, that prayer this morning will cause one to cry out, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And I pray today, if that is the prayer of someone who is crying out at this moment, we will lead them to a personal relationship with you. Honor that request, Lord. Save that soul that calls on your name. We'll give you the glory. The glory is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. If that's your prayer this morning, Lord, what must I do to be saved? It's not a hard answer. Here's the answer. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we try to suggest that we don't have any sin, we've never done any wrong, we haven't opposed God, 1 John 1 and 8 and 9 tells us that we make ourselves a liar and the truth is not in us. And really what the text is saying is, listen, be honest, confess that we've fallen short of God's glory. And so in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, particularly verse 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse from all unrighteousness. Not just what we know, but even what we are not aware of. So that takes us back to Romans 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made, but with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And my prayer for you this morning is that you make that confession. Lord, I need you. I want you. Save me that I might live with you in eternity. And in the meantime, that I might walk with you in this world that we currently have. And God will save you by the confession. It's not religious rituals. It's not whether I go to a certain church. It's the mere confession of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. What he has done for me, stood in the gap, gave his life that I might have life. Thou shall be saved. That's my prayer for you this morning. And if that's your confession, I got to tell you, you're born again. You're saved. Your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Now all you need to do is begin to walk in your righteousness with God. You join a church, you become a student of the Bible so that God through the Holy Spirit can begin to teach you what the text says in terms of your lifestyle and watch God bless your life in a very wonderful and powerful way. Well, we are grateful that you've been able to tune in with us and we pray that this moment has blessed your heart in a very mighty way. We certainly appreciate the contribution that each of you make 
in supporting this ministry financially, for without you, we would certainly have a very difficult, if not an inability, to be able to do what we do, but we are grateful for your continued support. And we seek your continued support as well, that we'll continue to preach the gospel. Today, somebody has begun a new life, and I want us to rejoice and be glad that God has changed somebody's life. Well, as we always say, never forget that God loves you, and so do I. Myself and the membership of the Great Luzon Baptist Church loves you. Pray that God will continue to bless you. Be blessed as you begin your fresh new life today and through the rest of the week. In Jesus' name.